All right, distinguished guests, lecturers, colleagues, members of the faculty, students, good afternoon. We do apologize for the late start and as such, without further ado, let's delve right into the proceedings. Today, we host the eighth staging of the Hillary Pamela Kelly Distinguished Lecture to pay homage to one of the iconic figures of the University of Technology, of course, Mrs. Hillary Pamela Kelly. My name is Rolando Smith, lecturer here in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. But this afternoon, it is indeed my pleasure to wear a different hat to serve in another capacity. And as such, I am tasked with the responsibility of moderating this afternoon's proceedings in this virtual space. So again, welcome to all of you. But indeed, there is an individual who I know can do a much better job at welcoming you. So I will be asking Dr. Warwick Latibodeer to bring some opening remarks at this time, Dr. Latibodir is the director of the Language Teaching and Research Center, the LTRC. A pleasant afternoon and welcome to everyone. Well over two decades ago, a master or mistress cultivator gathered ideas that would come together to form a seed that would grow and blossom having deeper roots and branches reaching out further than it starts. That person is Farmer Kelly, or as we know her, Pam Kelly. And it is my privilege as director of the Language Teaching and Research Center to open with remarks from the center. As with the growth process, things take time. Mrs. Kelly left UTEC some 10 years ago and served with the center for some 10 years, so we can do the maths. This lecture that we will be a part of is the School of Humanities and Social Sciences appreciation for Mrs. Pam Pamela Kelly's work for the center. At the time, the center was referred to as a self access center. Their students would with difficulties in the English language would come with their work essays and be given assistance both orally and written with activities prepared, some created, some generic to facilitate these students' needs. Ancillary staff would also benefit as they would be helped to do up their resumes and also letters of application. In essence, a self-access center for the School of Humanities importantly showed students the pathway in grammar and other language related skills. Some research was also done. In fact, a proficiency test came out of the self access center at the time. We in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences were thankful for the fruits produced and the individuals who have given support to this and certainly a warm welcome to everyone to this very important lecture. This, the Self Access Center has produced a lot of individuals. And one key person we want to mention is Dr. Erheldine Shakespeare. She will forever be mentioned with the Self Access Center because even before she got her doctorate, this was right where she started and got her start. Dr. Telfer and Mrs. Stuart McCoy benefited from the guiding hands of Mrs. Kelly. Grace Hamilton provided such a backbone support to the Self Access Center. Dr. Davis gave, gave great support, equipment and money for, from the budget for this Self Access Center to be set up. There are many colleagues at the time and some are still with us and some are not. Many colleagues who have rubbed shoulders with Miss Kelly. We're talking about Sheila Colson, Mrs. Joseph, Dr. Jones McKenzie, Mrs. Lois Curtin, Dr. Angus White, Dr. Kai Barrett, uh, Mrs. Miss Edmarie Scott, Mrs. Lundy, Miss Berry, Miss Dixon. Many of such individuals are still around. But we move from the self-access center and now we're the Language Teaching and Research Center. So thankful for this seed that has grown into the Language Teaching and Research Center. Mrs. Spencer Grizzle now does much of what the Self Access Center would have done at the time in assisting students with grammar holding workshops and the likes. Now we also have teams that are, are greater in number and more systematic in their approach to, to research. 
We have other events like the Pam, Kim Pam Kelly lecture, such as the issues in language. And of course, this Pam Kelly lecture um, addresses general specific needs relating to language coming out of the, the, the LTRC, which came out of the Self Access Center is also a part of debate. We also have many courses that emerge from the Language Teaching and Research Center. Notice we, we have a massive project that is on, being under, undertaken right now, which is called the VISA, yes, yeah, so a virtual self-access learning. Notice that when Ms. Mrs. Kelly was around, it was a self-access center. Now we have a virtual self-access learning. So this is now taking all that Mrs. Kelly would do and now put it virtually for students to be able to access things online and help themselves with grammar needs. Katal, the Caribbean Association of Tertiary Level Academic Literacy Practitioners, um, headed by um, Dr. John Kenzie, that is also coming out of the center with supporting academic literacy practitioners in the region. How this seed has grown to the LTRC and how it is that we have benefited immensely from the work that has been carried on by Mrs. Kelly, the school, the faculty, and the university. And it is for this reason we host the Pam Kelly Lecture, the eighth staging. Is in, it is indeed my privilege to indeed have shared opening remarks and welcome to everyone. Thank you so very much, Doctor. Thank you so much, Doctor. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Latibadir, for All right, we had some technical difficulties just now. So we'll continue. So thank you very much, Dr. Latibadir. He was sharing there about the legacy established by Mrs. Hillary Pamela Kelly. Of course, he mentioned that the self-access center was a seed that she actually planted and it is good to see that the seed has actually blossomed into all of these different initiatives and projects that uh, Dr. Latibodier just mentioned. Thank you so very much and I'd like to again welcome everyone. I see that the numbers are growing. I know this is not necessarily the ideal setting that we would prefer but we of course are grateful for these technological platforms so that we're able to convene just the same and if I should go by the comments in the chat I can see that the, the excitement and the enthusiasm is quite contagious. We are indeed in for a good evening. I'm going to be calling on the Dean of the Faculty of Education and Liberal Studies, uh, Professor Sherman Barrett, to bring greetings at this time. Thank you so much, Mr. Masters of Ceremonies, Dr. Warwick Latibodier, Director, Language Teaching and Research Center. Uh, I am not seeing all the people in the room, but I take it that the head of school of, of um, Humanities and Social Sciences would be in the room. And I want to acknowledge you in my opening greetings. Mrs. H. Pamela Kelly, our honored guests, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First, let me begin by welcoming you all to the Faculty of Education and Liberal Studies here at UTech Jamaica and to the eighth annual H. Pamela Kelly Distinguished Lecture under the theme, Whose Class Are You In? Language, Power and Disadvantage in Jamaica. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we must acknowledge the visionary behind this lecture, Dr. Harold McDermott, who during his term as director of the now Language Teaching and Research Center initiated the annual lecture. The wisdom of the initiative is shown in its sustainability, such that it has now become a feature on the faculty's calendar of activities. So we commend you for that and for all those who have carried it through. But ladies and gentlemen, I must 
acknowledge and recognize the person in whose honor the lecture is held, Mrs. Pamela Kelly. As I reflect on what to say, I, you know, and I heard Dr. Latibodier say, um, she has left us for 10 years. Well, I would say, does one say past lecturer in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences? Since she continues to respond to the various calls from us within the faculty and the university. Again, we express our appreciation for your continued service to the university in the various hats you have worn over the years. Not only were you a lecturer, but the founder of the center through which the lecture in your honor is hosted. The center now goes by a different name than when you first founded it, but its legacy continues. Ladies and gentlemen, we turn our attention to the matter of academic forum. Academic forums like this one, this public lecture forms, for my mind, a vital part of the landscape of any university as they provide spaces for academic discourse and knowledge sharing and to encourage new ways of thinking. A key purpose of these public lectures is for experts in their field to share their knowledge and to reflect on issues that are of national import. The theme this even, of this evening's lecture reads to my mind with major sociopolitical undertones that should offer much to debate. And so we anticipate the presentation by our distinguished lecturer. And it is my hope that a robust discussion will ensue thereafter, and that we would find it highly engaging. And so I wish for us a stimulating experience. And I would like to express my appreciation to the members of the planning team that has enabled us to be here this afternoon. So ladies and gentlemen, I am excited to have you and it is my trust that you will find that it was a very rewarding experience for you to be with us for the next two hours. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you so very much, Professor Barrett. And I do believe, I, I, I agree with you, that it will be quite a rewarding experience indeed. All right. And at this time, we are going to be asking Mrs. Beverly Josephs. She's going to be introducing and of course speaking a little bit about Mrs. Pamela Kelly. So I'm gonna be handing over to her at this point in time. Mrs. Josephs, take it away. Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity. All protocols observed. Prime Minister's Award for Excellence in 2013 for contribution to education. Outstanding service to the Norman Manley Foundation as a judge for their essay competitions. Outstanding service to the Lions Club of St. Andrew, University Orator, English teacher par excellence. These are but a few of the accolades amassed by Hilary Pamela Kelly in a career that has been studied with starlights of success. And yet, one of the hallmarks of this multifaceted lady is her humility, soft-spoken, quiet, unassuming, not one to draw attention to herself, and a lady of few words, not, one, not very talkative, but always imparting timely, impactful words of wisdom, tinged with a wry sense of humor and a twinkle in her eyes. A Wilmerian, Pam or Mrs. Kelly, began her sterling service to education at St. Hughes High School for Girls, where she spent 15 years, started first, Jamaica's first student book rental system, 
a mentoring program for the staff, was head of the English department, and rose to the position of vice principal. Her journey saw her doing a short stint at the Embassy of the Republic of Korea, and later experiencing entrepreneurship as a partner and co-director of Target English, where for 10 years, she taught English to non-native and native speakers of the language. The next leg of the journey took her to the University of Technology, Jamaica, which has been blessed to have her on staff for over 25 years. It was Pam's instrumentality, as you have heard, that this center, the LTRC now, was established. And she has served as senior lecturer on several faculty and Australia, Cambridge University, and the University of the West Indies. In 2015, when Dr. McDermott proposed the establishment of this Hillary Pamela Kelly lecture, it received resounding endorsement from faculty and management. During legacy bequeathed to those who passed through its doors of one who served unstintingly with excellence. The foundation for us all. Pam Marion motto, Age Quad Agis. Whatever you do, do it well. And with all of this, you would think she had no time for other things, but she's a dedicated and devoted member of her family. She focuses on her family and her friends and some of her friends she has had for a lifetime. She is a mother of three boys and three grandchildren who are her pride and joy. Our distinguished lecturer, Professor Carolyn Cooper, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, students all. It is my pleasure and privilege to present to you Mrs. Hilary Pamela Kelly. Ladies and gentlemen all, I'm pleased and honored to be once again participating in this annual lecture. It is a pleasure to see you all, or rather to see your names and a few faces on the screen. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for the general comments which have been offered by Dr. Latvodir, Prof. Barrett, uh, Mrs. Josephs, and Rolando as well. Thank you so much for all the kind thoughts. When I was first informed of the plan for this lecture eight years ago, I thought, oh, perhaps it will last for a couple of years and then be forgotten amid the changes and advances taking place at UTEC. But here we are, and I feel truly blessed to be still here and, with, and in which in what I think, or at least I hope, of sound mind. Thank you so much to Professor Charmaine Barrett, Dean of the Faculty of Education and Liberal Studies, for continuing to support the lecture. To the colleagues from the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, some of them passed, some still there. And to Dr. Dati Bodea, Director of the Language Teaching and Research Center, and his energetic staff for their tenacity in continuing to plan and execute the lecture. I'm gratified really to see how the center has evolved 
and have read with pride some of the recent research which has resulted from this new thrust. Congratulations. I really anticipate its continuing impact on teaching and learning on the Jamaican landscape. The issue of the Jamaican language, of which Professor Cooper is a true champion and remains one which ignite, it remains one which ignites a lot of emotions and debates. But it's also one which we as a nation have not fully acknowledged and explored. And so I'm happy that we are again giving it some attention this afternoon. The creation of the Self-Access Center, for which I am being most remembered, was in fact the result of my own experience with language. Born in the heart of the currently controversial Dry Harbor Mountains, I was transplanted at age 11 to an elite high school in Kingston, where my natural spoken language was not necessarily appreciated. You can take the man out of the country, but you cannot take the country out of the man. Were words I became accustomed to hearing. The fear of speaking bad or broken English kept me quiet, and I considered disadvantaged for perhaps three years. I laugh now at the memory of the weekly lessons in which we were made to repeat, how now, brown cow? Oh, my mother and brother, in London on Sunday, took money to buy some onions for Monday. Mind you, I actually appreciate the lessons now, as they have allowed me to address you this evening with some modicum of confidence. But it was as a result of this experience that I felt so keenly the need to assist the students at UTEC who were having the same feeling of inadequacy and less thanness. The Self-Access Center was to provide them a safe place where they could gain confidence in expressing themselves in writing and speech, both in English and in Jamaican, without feeling deficient and incompetent. For, like it or not, language can and does place us either at an advantage or disadvantage in many areas of our lives. But don't start worrying. I have no intention of presenting today's lecture. I am happy to leave the task in the very capable hands of the illustrious Professor Emeritus Carolyn Cooper, who continues to speak and write her truth in both chaka chaka spelling, proper proper spelling, and in standard Jamaican English. Mm -hmm. Professor Cooper, it is an honor to have you spend some time with us. Thank you for agreeing to bring the Jamaican language situation and its consequences to our attention once more. We eagerly anticipate your presentation with its intriguing title. I'm sure it will be entertaining, perhaps even controversial, but always thought provoking. Thank you all again for planning and executing this eighth lecture. I know a lot of work had to go into the produ production of this virtual staging, and I'm truly appreciated for your efforts at making the occasion a success. Thank you, friends, family, colleagues, past and present, who have taken the time to join us in person and on Zoom. Sorry we're not able to share the chit chat and refreshments which usually follows at this lecture. But fingers crossed, next January, we'll do it. God and COVID permitting. So until then, thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you to Mrs. Hillary Pamela Kelly there speaking about her pride in the evolution of the center. And we do owe a debt of gratitude to you, Mrs. Hillary Pamela Kelly, for your vision, for your ingenuity, and also your instrumentality. And of course, as you've heard before, ladies and gentlemen, this lecture that we're having, this distinguished lecture series, is actually a fruit of her labor and her hard work. So we thank her so much for that. And she also gave us a little foreshadowing, if you may, as to what it is that we're going to be hearing in a few. Many of us are so excited to hear about the topic of this lecture. Uh, whose class are you in? 
language, power, and disadvantage in Jamaica. But just before we get to that, let's just do backtrack a bit and do a few housekeeping matters. We would like this afternoon's lecture to actually trend on social media. So especially for the younger persons here and my students who are in-house, if you may, uh, we ask that you use the hashtag HPK, that's Hillary Pamela, Pamela Kelly lecture. So that let's go again, HPKL 2022. So whenever it is that you're seeing anything on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, we're simply asking that you use that hashtag. We're going to be putting it in the chat in a few. We'd also like you to make note of any questions that you would like to ask our lecturer, Professor uh, Carolyn Cooper. So keep those questions until later in the program as you will get an opportunity to ask them in our short question and answer segment. And we will be asking you to state your name followed by your question. So when we get there, we will you know, cross that bridge. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment we have been waiting for, whose class are you in? Yeah, I mean, whose class are you in? Have you been able to answer that question as yet? Well, if not, you should be able to respond to that by the end of Professor Caroline Cooper's lecture. But without, before we actually get into the lecture, I'm gonna be inviting one of my favorite colleagues Mrs. Tressica Campbell Dawes. She's a lecturer here in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, and she's also the coordinator of business communication to introduce our keynote speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for this eighth H. Pamela Kelly Distinguished Lecture. Arthur Ashe once said, True greatness is starting where you are, using what you have and doing what you can. Our keynote speaker, Professor Emerita Carolyn Cooper embodies this concept and I'll tell you why. Her journey started at St. Hughes High School and later at the University of the West Indies, Mona, where she completed her Bachelor of Arts in English in 1971. Professor Cooper was awarded a Canadian International Development Agency Fellowship to do her Master's of Arts at the University of Toronto, where she also completed her PhD. She gained valuable experience teaching at the Atlantic Union College for five years before returning to the University of West Indies Mona in 1980. At the UA, Professor Cooper used what she had, a wealth of knowledge and experience and a flair for the dramatic to teach courses on Caribbean, African-American, and African literature, as well as popular culture. For over a decade, her course, Reggae Poetry, attracted students from across faculties. In 1992, Professor Cooper did what she could to raise awareness of Jamaica's cultural roots through the country's popular music. To this end, she conceived the Reggae Studies Unit and provided intellectual leadership for this far-reaching enterprise for more than a decade since its institutionalization at Mona in 1994. Professor Cooper is the author of two influential books, Noises in the Blood, Orality, Gender, and the Vulgar Body of Jamaican Popular Culture, published 1993, and Sound Clash, Jamaican Dancehall Culture at Large, published 2004. She co-edited with Dr. Eleanor Wint, Bob Marley, The Man and His Music, 2003. She's also the editor of the award-winning Global Reggae, that's a reader, published 2012. She's currently editing the Bob Marley Lectures, the proceedings of an engaging lecture series on Jamaican popular music, which she initiated in 1997 as coordinator of the Reggae Studies Unit. A well-known media personality in Jamaica, Professor Cooper is a public intellectual committed to widening debates on cultural politics beyond the walls of the university. She writes a weekly column for the Sunday Gleaner, and she posts on her bilingual blog, Jamaican Woman Tongue. She has appeared in numerous documentaries on Caribbean culture produced by a wide range of local and international media houses, including Television Jamaica, Al Jazeera TV, National Public Radio, USA, the BBC, 
ARD TV Germany, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, and B World Connection out of Guadeloupe. For her outstanding work in the field of education, Professor Cooper was awarded the national honor, the Order of Distinction in the rank of commander in 2013. What better person to speak to us today on the topic of language use and social class under the title, Whose Class Are You In? Language, Power, and Disadvantage in Jamaica. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Professor Emerita Carolyn Cooper. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much, Ms. Dawes, for that wonderfully warm introduction. I am so happy to be here to give the Pamela Kelly Distinguished Lecture. Mrs. Kelly has done a fantastic job of pushing our language. When she told that story of growing up in primary school and feeling alienated, it resonated with so much of what I want to say this evening. Thank you, Mrs. Kelly. Once upon a time, I was invited to give a talk at a primary school during Heritage Week. Since we're supposed to be celebrating Jamaican culture, I decided to address the children in our mother tongue. Bright faces shining, they listened with complete attention. Afterwards, some of them wistfully asked, Miss, when you're coming back. This was probably the first time an adult had ever addressed them formally at school in their home language. Over refreshments, the principal confessed that she had always wondered why it was appropriate to use patwa, quote unquote, in the classroom only for literature, like the poems of Miss Lou, but not for any other subject. And she related a disturbing incident she had seen a little boy running in the schoolyard between classes and stopped him to ask, whose class are you in? He replied, hey, Amos. She repeated her question and the child repeated his answer. The principal even rebuked the child for saying E. That's one of those nasal interjections in the Jamaican language that is used to express confusion. Eventually, she catch up herself and asked the boy, who are your teacher? The child immediately gave his teacher's name. The boy knew his teacher. What he didn't know was English. I speculate that if the principal had said, who for, instead of whose, who for class are you in? The child would probably have understood the mixture of English and Jamaica. Now, that story reminded me of one of my friends who on a visit home from the US, went to one of our hospitals looking for a colleague. He asked the security guard for Dr. X and was told that he wasn't around. He then asked, and where might he be? To which the security guard replied, me not know nobody named Mighty, sir. <laughs> at a reception at a local hotel, I once foolishly asked the waitress, any prospect of edibles? Her response put me firmly in my place. I don't understand one word you just say. <laughs> Without any hint of embarrassment, this self-confident young woman made it quite clear that I was the one who had failed to communicate with her. Me shame like a dog. The bookish question had just slipped out. I quickly rephrased it in straightforward English and the young woman assured me that yes, food come in. In this instance, it wasn't a question of English versus Jamaican. It was plain English versus a completely inappropriate highfalutin register. Many speakers of English in Jamaica casually assume that they will be universally understood even when they use expressions that are not at all common. In my case and my friends, the initial failure of communication didn't really matter that much. We could easily sort out the problem. 
But for that little boy in the schoolyard, continuous miscommunication will ultimately determine whether or not he becomes eligible, eligible for tertiary education. Exactly what will this child ever learn in the classroom if his constant responses teachers as early as primary school is a dumbfounded, e miss, and most of his teachers will be female. This fact raises the unsettling matter of the relatively small number of male role models in our primary and secondary schools, but that's a whole other story. Language education in Jamaican schools is a matter that must be given urgent attention. We simply cannot afford to continue with business as usual. We need to find new ways of teaching English so that our success rate will be much higher than it is now. And we must ensure that all students learn to distinguish between English and Jamaica. The difficulty some of us have recognizing differences between the two languages was evident in an eye-opening episode of the ITN Fancy Cat Show. People on the street were asked to translate a few Jamaican sentences into English. Not one person was able to give an accurate translation. They all seem to think that if you're speaky spoky and you round up your mouth, that's English. Pronunciation, not the structure of the languages, is all that matters. And whose fault is that that they don't know better? The school system has failed them in both senses of the word. Word, sorry. Whose class are you in? For me, the principal's question is not just about a little boy running loose in the schoolyard. Symbolically, it's a much broader philosophical inquiry about which social class each of us claims. The question raises a contentious issue of social power and privilege in our society. Who is disadvantaged and who is not? Many Jamaicans in the class of English speakers tend to have great disdain for those in the class of non-English speakers, those underprivileged souls who routinely speak Jamaica. In fact, English speakers as a class don't even think that Jamaican is a language in its own right. It's a corrupt negation of English. And of course, if you don't speak a bona fide language, or as the DJs would say, bona fide, you are clearly subhuman. Louise Bennett Coverley, the much loved Miss Lou, our premier poet of the Jamaican language to whom the principal at that primary school referred, sets the record straight in Jamaica language, which is published in Auntie Rochise, a collection of her radio programs edited by Professor Emeritus Mervyn Morris. Miss Lou gives this humorous report. My Auntie Rochise, that it boil our temper and really vex our for true. Anytime she hear anybody a style with Jamaican dialect as corruption of the English language. For if that be the case, then them should I call English language corruption of Norman, French, and Latin, and all the entire language what them say that English is derived from. Wanna hear the word? Derived. English is a derivation, but Jamaican dialect is corruption. What an inferiority we derive to. In English, my Aunt Roche says that it makes her blood boil and really angers her whenever she hears anybody describing our Jamaican dialect as corruption of the English language. Perhaps that's the case, then they should describe the English language as a corruption of Norman French and Latin and all those languages that they say English is derived from. Did you take note of the word? Derived. English is a derivation, but the Jamaican dialect is corruption. How unfair. We are derived too. Ms. Lou also acknowledges the African elements in the Jamaican language. And DeRoji said that if Jamaican dialect is corruption of the English language, then it is also a corruption of the African Chui language too. Oh, and DeRoji says that if the Jamaican dialect is a corruption of the English language, then it is also a corruption of the African Chui language too. Indeed. And Auntie Rochi elaborates. For Jamaica dialect did start when we English forefathers did start most and bound with African ancestors 
to stop talking for their African language altogether and learn to talk so so English. Because we English forefathers couldn't understand what we African ancestors they must have said to them one another when they was attacking their African language to them one another. But we African ancestors them pop we English forefathers them yes pop them and this guys of the English language to project for them African language in such a way that we English forefathers them still couldn't understand what we African ancestors them was attacked about when they was attacked to them one another in English. When the Jamaican dialect emerged, when our English forefathers started to compel our African ancestors to stop speaking their own African languages altogether and learn to speak only English because our English forefathers couldn't understand what our African ancestors were saying to each other when they were speaking their own African languages. But our African ancestors tricked our English forefathers, yes, tricked them and disguised the English language in order to project their own African languages in such a way that our English forefathers still couldn't understand what our African ancestors were talking about when they were speaking to each other. Miss Lou's inclusion of the English forefathers in the family history craftily acknowledges the English elements in Jamaica and simultaneously underscores the cultural erasure that is an essential element of the enslavement process. Then it also derides the limitations of the English colonizers who could not master the African languages. Indeed, could not or would not. Indeed, the Africans who colonize English are represented as far more inventive than the monolingual English who are trapped in the prison of congenital linguistic superiority. Ms. Lou acknowledges the role of language in defining community and asserting cultural power. Through her mouthpiece, Auntie Rochi, Ms. Lou con conceives the emergence of the Jamaican language as the end result of a subversive political process. The new language is a cunning revolutionary assertion of African verbal creativity and cultural autonomy. No, this is not at all how the Jamaican language is perceived by the social and political elites here. The late Professor, the Honorable Rex Netherford, former Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, describes Louise Bennett's experimental creative writing in Jamaican in this way in his 1966 introduction to her collection of poetry, Jamaica Labrish, quote, in a quarter of a century, she has carved designs out of the shapeless and unruly substance that is the Jamaican dialect, unquote. Netflix's use of the metaphor of the plastic arts, carving, further alienates the Jamaican mother tongue from conventional discourse of what constitutes a language. Unlike real languages that have shape and rules and grammar, our out of order language is according to Nettleford and quote, idiom whose limitations as a bastard tongue are all too evident, unquote. To be fair to Nettleford, that statement was published more than half a century ago. I suspect that he must have changed his mind over time. But even today, there are many supposedly intelligent Jamaicans who have not moved beyond this primitive emotional view of the local language. More than a decade and a half before I told the story of the child running in the schoolyard as a column, Whose Class Are You In?, which was published in the Gleaner, I wrote my very first column for the Observer in April, 1993. It was on language politics, which I spelled using the specialist writing system for the Jamaican language that was invented by the Jamaican linguist, Frederick Cassidy. Naturally, it seems, there was resistance to the strange spelling, and even more so to the content of the column. For almost 30 years, I've been making the same argument over and over again about language, power, and disadvantage in Jamaica. And sadly, the argument don't done. To Hibbert's song, Never get weary is my consolation. 
was down in the valley for a very long time and I never get weary yet. I was walking on the shore when they took me on the ship and they threw me overboard and I swam right out of the belly of the whale and I never get weary yet. In that first column for the observer, which was actually in English, just the headline was in Jamaica. I made the observation that in Jamaica, language is one of the sites in which the power of differing social classes is contested. Simply put, people judge you by the way you speak. Assumptions are made about your social class background, your intelligence, your very humanity based on the language you use to express yourself. You are as you speak, high class or low, uptown or down, bright or dunce, cultured or not. English, the official language of the nation, is a language of government, the law courts, school, the media. It is a language of social and political power. The English language is a legacy of British colonial rule. This brings me to the formidable Miss Pence Grizzle, who persuaded me to give this lecture. She said it was my recent Gina column, why do so many words come from Latin that prompted the invitation? So it's most appropriate that I tell the story of the origins of that column as I rehearse my argument about the relationship between language and political context. On the very last day of our language arts classes for the term, my seven-year-old student Cole, my nephew, gave a report on Martin Luther King. He chirpily said, Dr. King was eloquent. When I asked him what the word meant, he couldn't answer. And all I said was parrot. That's a running joke we have had, we had had for the last seven months of our virtual classes. He was not amused by the name. He knew I was making fun of him for repeating a word he didn't understand. He quickly Googled it. And I told him the word came from Latin. Then my student completely redeemed himself from parrothood by asking this perceptive question. Why do so many words come from Latin? Over our months of conversation, I'd been telling him about the origin of the big words he didn't know. And most of the time they came from Latin. So now he wanted to know why. It's such a joy to teach an intellectually curious child. You are challenged to provide age appropriate answers. I had to go back to 1066 AD. That's the year William, Duke of Normandy conquered England and French became the official language. Auntie Roche alluded to this conquest in her impassioned critique of the politics of corruption versus derivation. I explained to my eager student that many Latin words actually came into English through English, through French. Latin words came into English through French like eloquence. That's a 12th century old French word from Latin eloquentia, which was borrowed by English in the 14th century. This child now understands the relationship between political conquest and language acquisition. Not in those terms, of course. Merriam-Webster.com elaborates the cultural consequences of political domination, quote, the Norman conquest as William's takeover came to be known set off many changes in English culture, including its language. William put French speaking Normans in nearly all of the positions of power in the country. And the result was a disappearance of vernacular English from the written record for almost two centuries. Meanwhile, English got Frenchified, French words, mostly Anglo-French words, as we call the particular kind of medieval French used in England, dominated the language of literature, law, and administration. Many of these dominating terms have stuck our, around. And Miss Pensgrew, I forgot to cue you in, so it's time for you to come in, my selector, with your slides from it, please. I should have warned you, yes. So here are some words, old English origin, French origin. Think versus conceive. Thoughts versus ideas. Understand, comprehend. Foretell, predict. Word book, dictionary. 
book craft, literature, knowledge, science, hearsay, rumor, wisdom. All right, colleagues. So this is, of course, live and we're talking about technology here. So these things are actually bound to happen. We do apologize for the inconvenience. We are still trying to contact Professor Cooper, but I'd just like to gauge the feedback thus far. So is there anyone who would like to share anything coming out of what it is that Professor Carlin Cooper has shared just now based on our topic? Whose class are you in language power and disadvantage in Jamaica? She shared quite a bit, of course, talking about our language context and situation here in Jamaica. Quite unique, quite diverse, and dare I say, quite complex as well. So if there's anybody who would just like to get the discussion going until we're able to, con to contact Professor Cooper, anyone who would like to share anything based on what she has said, or would you like to challenge anything that she has said thus far? Um, and we'll try to recap again when it is that she is back on stream. So would anybody like to get the conversation going? I see Abba's microphone is off or on rather. I don't know if she wants to say something, Abba. Yes, I would. Good afternoon. Tasha Good Eva. afternoon, my dear. What would you like to share with us? Okay, so, you know, she was speaking and I was thinking about you know, of course, language being part of our culture. And she spoke about, you know, the African influence and, you know, the French influence and, you know, the, the European influence on our language. And I was also thinking the, the bi-directional, uh, about the bi-directional nature of culture, you know, the formation of culture in that we're both culture bearers, you know, so we carry the culture and we're culture makers, you know, so we create you know, and even, even making up our own words and creating our, our own language. Um, you know, and I'm thinking about also the, this argument that we frame, we create almost our worlds with language, you know, so it's almost like we shape our experience with the language that we use. But at the same time, um, based on what Professor Carmen Cooper was saying, people respond to us based on the language that we use as well. So it's like both things are happening at the same time. We are, <laughs> we are affecting the world by the language that we use and the world is responding to us based on the language that we use. And we are shaping our own world, you know, with the language. So it's, it's a whole um, complex situation that's happening right there. And, you know, it's just mind blowing. Um, to me, you know, it's, it's really fabulous what she's doing, and you know, I'm really enjoying it. And I really hope she, she comes back. Yeah, so that's, that's all I want to say for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abba, sharing there that we are both culture bearers as well as culture makers, and she's connecting that to how it is that we utilize language, how it is that our language has kind of set a precedence for you know, the rest of the world. Many persons are now uh, looking into studying the unique nature of our language making us culture bearers one and also culture uh, makers so i think she was going from the angle of the impact that we're able to leave uh, on the world as a result of our language uh mrs joseph's over to you oh hi i was hi. well it was just getting to the fascinating part for me i know because i don't this know i think i seem to have forgotten that there was this french aspect to the to the history so mm -hmm. you know i really hope you get her back so she can finish <laughs> to focus on the french yes, component but, yes because but, but so course, far so good yeah because of course you know there are several theories out there about how it is that our um some persons argue that it's not a dialect per se, but our Creole has been shaped and the different influences. And she was going right. to be focusing on the French influence. So that would have been yeah. interesting to hear. Yes. And I really, it, it, I'm sure you will get her back. I, I'm trying to understand why it's taken so long, but let's hope she will get back. The joys of the technology. I'm telling you, <laughs> to love it and hate it at the same time. We are trying to see your sleep. Any update from our Anybody else? Okay, done it. Yes, this is her sister. She oh, hi. Called. She says nobody's calling her on the numbers that she provided. She was trying yes. to help you guys. Oh, well, our team is trying to, to get her on. I don't know what's going on. 
Okay. So Patrice is asking if it is that she could WhatsApp her, send her a WhatsApp. But we have been trying based on the numbers that we received. Okay, send her a WhatsApp. She's still on, on my line. Okay, thanks. She had to Good afternoon. If you look in the chat, you'll notice that Dr. Professor Cooper is still signed in on something. So she probably yes. needs to disengage that as well. Okay. She's still showing up in the chat as a participant. So she's she's still signed in on something. Yes, I'm seeing that. Let me see if our health team can. While you're on, right, yes, so we we've, we've coming to you, Mr. Taylor. So we we've tried to remove her from the participants list. So we're going to ask her to try again and also to contact Patrice Spencer Grizzle, of course, our organizer for the lecture here through WhatsApp. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't have, I don't have a camera, but I am I'm fine. Fine. hearing, hearing Eva Williams talk is, is a lovely thing because we, I don't think we realize how much we actually influence the world. Um, I was at a concert and one of our top artists was telling us he had just returned from Europe and that there were over 200 skia bands, skia bands operating in Europe. And yet still we had not one of them in Jamaica. Now, if you want to find out what that influence is like, all of you can go on and look up Hard Man for Dead. By the Hard Man for Dead, which is a Prince Buster tune, by the Northern Jazz Orchestra, Ska Jazz Orchestra, right? Just look it up, you will enjoy it. So I, I, I hope I'm not taking away. Right, we're definitely gonna look it up. Um, hard Man Fidel yourself. by- That's Jamaica's influence well, well, world where they can't yeah, professor... English. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ron. Professor Cooper is back. I'm back, but please remember, Please remember, it is a screen sharing that caused the problem in the first place. So we have gone past these now. I said these already. So could you please take me, take off the screen sharing and so that I can get back to the talk because I, I boy, the screen sharing was not worth the stress of um, losing so much time. Anyhow, um, let me, all right, okay, okay, let me, see, let me see if I can find back my place. I can't even remember where I did reach, Lord of mercy. Good, good, good. Come on, come on, come on. I think you were going to speak you about and your the student. influence yes. of the French. Yes, we're yeah. talking about the French and the English. Right. Yeah. All yeah. right, yes. Unlike my seven-year-old student, everybody with me? Yes. Good. Yes. <laughs> like, yes, miss. Yes, miss. Unlike my seven-year-old student, many hardback Jamaicans are not in the least bit intellectually curious. They don't seem to understand that one of the consequences of colonization is mental slavery. They are not at all inclined to question the prejudices they have inherited. Like parrots, they uncritically repeat the same old misconceptions. Their contempt for the Jamaican language, for example, is congenital. You just can't get them to open their closed mind. It's no use making the point that English isn't all that pure, nor is it English to that. Dictionary.com confirms that, quote, about 80% of the entries in any English dictionary are borrowed mainly from Latin. Unquote. Auntie Roche strikes again, all them Tara language, what they said that English is derived from. Dictionary.com notes that, quote, over 60% of all English words have Greek or Latin roots, 60%. In the vocabulary of the sciences and technology, the figure rises to over 90%. About 10% of the Latin vocabulary has found its way directly into English without an intermediary, usually French. Now, in April 2020, my column on creative face masks made from undergarments was published with this headline, 
female unmentionables out in the open. This is how John H. Christian responded on the Gleaner's website. Great article, Carolyn Cooper. Only the English language could, with a smattering of your beloved patios, you know, the, 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 whatever spell check or change patios, change patio to patios, with a smattering of your beloved patio. Only English, only the English language could, with a smattering of your beloved patois, be able to paint such a picture. Well done. Now write the entire piece in patois, LOL. Now, because I sometimes like to humor readers, I translated the first two paragraphs into Jamaican and posted it with this comment. Thanks. Here's a quick translation of the first two paragraphs. Don't persist in putting limits on the Jamaican language. Don't test. So first, here's the English original. Proverbial wisdom confirms that when trouble tech man picking shirt fit him. Now, when coronavirus frightened man, female underwear fit him. Male cross-dressers already know the pleasures of sporting female garments. These days, men of all persuasions are wearing panties and bras as masks to block transmission of the virus. Unmentionables appeared in the English language in the 19th century during the reign of prim and proper Queen Victoria. The word referred to trousers. By 1910, it became even more unmentionable, meaning underwear. Why were undergarments so vulgar that they couldn't be mentioned in polite society? I translated the headline, female unmentionables out in the open this way. Woman hidey hidey business out a road. And here's the rest of the translation. Old time people say, when trouble tech man pick me shirt fit him. Today, when coronavirus frightened man, woman draws and brazier fit him. The man they will love just up in a woman clothes, them don't know how it's sweet. You know, them your time, all kind of man and brandish drawers and brazier upon them face to stop the virus from spread all about. Hide the hide the business. That's how the English people them think about woman brazier and drawers. You know, if you talk about that, them said them they are unmentionables. That they were turned up in an English language in the 1800s when nice and distant Queen Victoria did they find the throne. First time, unmentionables didn't mean trousers. By 1910, and then you couldn't talk about it. It started to mean Brazil and draws. But when there's a racha, you couldn't talk about them if you're a tapanaris. Baron B jumped into the conversation with a bogus compliment. Not bad at all. How long do you think it would take you to translate Macbeth into Patwa? Me just kiss me teeth. Globe Trotter eagerly responded to Baron B. LOL, I've been waiting for a translation of a physics lesson for several years now in vain. So far, none of the UWE patro intellectuals seem willing to indulge me in my mockery of their efforts. Too bad, seeing them twist themselves into knots, translating uniserial modules over finite dimensional algebras would have been priceless. As was to be expected, most of the words in Globetrotter's Mickey Mouse test are of Latin origin. Uni, serial, modules, finite, dimensional. Algebra is some Arabic. And even over, which comes from English, Old English, over, is of Germanic origin. I asked Dr. Andre Coy, a physicist at the University of the West Indies, Mona, to do the Jamaican translation. His research focuses on speech and his research focuses on speech and language technology and he's developing a Jamaican English translator. And I was so pleased when Dr. Coy asked me to give him as many of my columns written in Jamaican as I could so that he could use them as a database, part of the database for developing the translator. All them people who love to me waste time, so I'm waste time coming useful for physics. Dr. Coy didn't need to twist himself into a knot. Here's his translation. Take one non-zero module over one finite dimensional algebra. If the lattice will come up from the sub-module them from one chain, then you call the module uniserial. Then your module are the simplest type at in decomposable. Like speakers of English, we can borrow scientific terms from Greek and Latin. That's how languages expand. The dominance of English as a world language makes us assume a very narrow attitude to language in Jamaica. 
we don't seem to realize that multilingualism is a good thing. In Europe, the English are the least multilingual of Europeans who generally, other Europeans generally all do learn English. The English already speak English, so of course they don't need to learn a foreign language. In Jamaica, we have absorbed much of the English snobbery about the English language. A classic example is a letter to the editor published in the Gleaner in November 2004 with this headline, Degradation of English. It wasn't just the usual lament about the declining standards. This writer was suffering from a particularly bad case of English titis. This is a quite common disease in Jamaica, which affects mostly middle-class people who are fortunate enough to have learned English. It puffs them up with vanity. Every now and then they do get deflated. They tend to make a lot of silly mistakes when they run up their mouth too much and end up chatting foolishness. Just look at these sentences from the Dina letter, particularly the misuse of the big words obsequiously, derogatory, and didactic. Quote, there has been a gradual and general degradation in all of society's once obsequiously upheld standards and morals. Seven to 10 year old youth I myself have spoken to are totally illiterate, having been exposed to a morally and rhetorically derogatory system they live in and the frivolity of the English language didactic system, unquote. Anyhow, that is not the best joke. Hear the rest of the story. The writer of the letter is an upstanding citizen. Quite commendably, he volunteers his services at a local clinic as a receptionist. Regrettably, he feels nothing but contempt for patients who are competent in Jamaican and not in English. So here's a receptionist account of his conversation with a woman at the clinic. I asked her with all civility, what treatment would you like to have on your teeth? Her reply, what you say, sir? In thinking that I might have spoken too softly, I again asked the question, this time at the top of my voice, only to hear the reply. May I understand what you just said? I then repeated the question rather brusquely, cleaning, extraction, or filling. Oh, and that you did say. She blurted out. Yes, that was what I said, ma'am, I replied. Now when that part of the registration was taken care of, it was time to ask a question. Could you give me the name of an address of your next of kin? Unsurprisingly, her reply was, what you say, sir? Next of kin, ma'am. Our name, sir, she said, completely perplexed. End of story. Well, that's all he reports. I assume he went on to explain even more brusquely that next of kin means a close relative. And I'm quite sure that the self-confident woman would have asked him, that why I never said so, sir. That's why the story ends so abruptly with the woman's complete perplexity. Mm -hmm. I'm still there. I just, I heard somebody say, mm -hmm, so let me, I went to check. That's why the story ends so abruptly with the woman's complete perplexity. After all, this superior man wouldn't publicly admit to being made a fool of by a woman who speaks a degraded language. The man is obviously bilingual, yet he absolutely refuses to speak Jamaican or simple English for that matter. He's not interested in communicating with the woman. What he wants to do is show her up. He's not surprised that the woman doesn't understand next of kin, and yet he makes no attempt to translate the term. The Oxford English Dictionary describes next of kin as obsolescent, meaning going out of use or date. Backward people like our letter writer are obsequiously holding on to ancient words. They themselves are rapidly going out of date. Incidentally, obsequious is labeled rare in my dictionary. It used to mean obedient, dutiful, but its present meaning is much more negative, servilely compliant, fawning, cringing, who the cap fits. Two centuries after the Norman conquest, it was the poet Geoffrey Chaucer who brought English back into the written record. He's honored as a father of English literature or to use the English, old English word, book craft. The History of English website notes that quote, during these Norman rule centuries, 
in which English as a language had no official status and no regulation, English had become the third language in its own country. It was largely a spoken rather than written language and effectively sank to the level of a patois or creole, unquote. Not surprisingly, the website reports, quote, that the peasantry and our classes, the vast majority of the population, an estimated 95% continue to speak English, considered by the Normans a low-class vulgar tongue, unquote. Sounds familiar? There are hopeful signs. In 2002, the Jamaican Language Unit, JLU, was established in the Department of Language, Linguistics, and Philosophy at the University of West Indies, Mona, a result of the visionary leadership of Professor Hubert Devenish. He became the first coordinator of the unit, and on retirement, he was succeeded by Dr. Joseph Farquharson. The department's website tells the story of this brilliant innovation, and I quote, in May 2001, representations were made to the Joint Select Committee of the Parliament of Jamaica on the draft Charter of Rights, Constitutional Amendment Bill, on the need to include within the Charter freedom from discrimination on the grounds of language. The point was made that many citizens of Jamaica lack competence in English, the language in which services of the state are normally provided. The vast majority, <coughs> excuse me, of such persons are speakers of Jamaican, widely referred to as patron. It was argued that failure to provide services of the state in a language in such general use or discriminatory treatment by office of the state based on the inability of a citizen to use English was a violation of the rights of citizens so affected. The proposal was made that freedom from discrimination on the ground of language be inserted into the Charter of Rights. To support such a right, it was recommended that a language planning agency be set up to deal with issues such as one, a standard writing system for Jamaican, two, the development of technical and administrative terminology in the language for use by officers of the state, three, the monitoring of state agencies with respect to the non-discriminatory provision of services in the two languages in general use, that is English and Jamaican, for published education on the language issue. The Joint Select Committee Report 2002, page 29, states that, quote, the general consensus of the committee after discussion on the matter is that the establishment of an agency of the type mentioned would be a prerequisite to any constitutional guarantee of protection from discrimination on the ground of language and that such an agency should be established. Such an institution would assist in educating and enlightening people on the issue of discrimination on the ground of language so that eventually a guarantee of protection from such discrimination would find its place in the constitution, end of the quote. The report goes on to state that the committee was strongly of the view that Parliament should encourage the Department of Language, Linguistics, and Philosophy of the University of the West Indies to pursue this work and to report appropriately on that work as it progresses. In a letter from the Chairman of the Joint Select Committee dated 28 February 2002, from the Chairman of the Committee, Senator the Honorable A.J. Nicholson, Nicholson QC, Attorney General and Minister of Justice, reports the recommendations of the committee with regard to the setting up of a language agency modeled on the Antillian Linguistic Institute of the Netherlands Antilles and pledges that the Ministry of Justice stands ready to assist as may become necessary. Well, after all this time, I don't think um, discrimination on the basis of language is yet in the constitution, but that doesn't mean that the Jamaican language unit's work has not been successful. Over the last two decades, the unit has made many advances. To a large degree, the unit has fulfilled its goals. One of its most outstanding accomplishments, where the goals that it could fulfill, the unit cannot force parliament to do what they're supposed to do. One of the unit's most outstanding accomplishments is a translation of primary school textbooks into the Jamaican language. These were essential for the successful bilingual education program the unit introduced in select primary schools, and it was successful. I heard two of the children, a boy and a girl on TV, reading in both English and Jamaican, 
reading fluently. Unfortunately, the experiment ended as the students were coming up to um, the time to take their exams for high school. Teachers got jumpy, they felt if the students don't pass, um, it, I think at the time it was GSAT, it would be a poor reflection, so it was scrapped. But what I think needs to happen is that the Ministry of Education needs to get schools in select areas in which to which parents will willingly send their children for bilingual education because i believe most jamaican parents who speak only jamaican would be willing to take a chance on their children's future if they felt that they could learn both languages so it's just paralysis on the part of the ministry of education that nothing much has been accomplished i've written to the current minister i've sent her stuff about bilingual education she promised to read it I haven't heard back from her yet, but I guess, you know, eventually I will. COVID has crashed most of the routine um, systems that would enable her easy response to my suggestion. The unit, Jamaican Language Unit has launched a broadcast Jamaican YouTube channel where many exciting programs in the Jamaican language are available. And a very popular program is the news in the Jamaican language. Big up, JLU. In my own practice as a public intellectual, I have seen some advances. When I first started to write a column for the Observer, I insisted that it had to be bilingual. One week in English, one week in Jamaica. It was quite a fight. The editors wanted to know why couldn't I write three weeks in English and just one week in Jamaica. I told them, no, the English column was married to Jamaica in the same way that scarce goods in the market are married to more plentiful ones. And they agreed. Now, I got a lot of abuse from writing in Jamaica. I can't tell you all kinds of letters to the editor get cuss and cuss and cuss and cuss. The same thing happened when I started to write for the Gleaner. But surprisingly, in recent times, I have found that when I write in Jamaica, people no longer quarrel about the language. They quarrel about the content of what I've written. So clearly, they have just accepted the fact that, boy, you know, me really understand the Jamaican, you know, even though sometimes they like to carry on bad, like they can't read it and it is so difficult. And this is even though I use two writing systems, you know, one that I call Chaka Chaka, which is based on the notoriously irregular writing system of English, and the other that I call Proper Proper, which was designed by Frederick Cassidy and updated by the Jamaican Language Unit. So in conclusion, one of these days, perhaps two centuries after political independence from Britain, we will claim full cultural independence. The Jamaican language will be respected in the land of its origin and literacy in the language will become standard practice. We will no longer discriminate against people whose primary language is Jamaican because the school system would have become so sophisticated that they would have been bilingually educated and they will also be competent in English. So 200 years from now, a curious child may ask, what makes so much of the Jamaican word them come from English? Because bilingualism will be the norm, I predict. The child could just as easily choose to ask that question in English. Why do so many Jamaican words come from English? And the answer would start at 1655. Thank you. Um, Mike was not. Okay, thank you so very much, Professor Carolyn Cooper. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, a riveting and engaging presentation. Feel free to show your appreciation in the chat. And you know, in the interest of time, Professor Carolyn Cooper, if you just permit us, we just have a few questions. I know after such a presentation, uh, my colleagues here uh, have questions. They have uh, issues that they'd like you to elaborate on. Let me just say, ladies and gentlemen, also in the interest of time, we will not necessarily be able to 
accommodate all the questions, but we will do as much as we can. And the first question that came in uh, came from Paul Codner. And he said, Professor Cooper, you raised the very important question of gender when you alluded to the scarcity of male teachers at the primary and secondary levels. Do you have any thoughts about what accounts for this paucity, uh, especially taking into account gendered perceptions of language use and maybe even the teaching profession? So yeah. that's a question there from Paul Cardinal. Yes, I big up Paul. Oh, listen, Paul is alluding to the fact that in popular, in popular Jamaican culture, English is associated with um, a kind of femininity. That is all, that is really basically, you know. Um, I remember Loving Dear once um, spoke at a forum at the University of the West Indies and he said, you know, if you're at a, if a woman is at a dance and a man comes up to her and says, may I have the pleasure of this dance with you? She definitely know, so she don't want to dance with him because he don't know of a while, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, the assumption is that from a man speaking English, you know, it is very effeminate. So that is one of the issues. So the, the association of competence in English with femaleness that is reinforced by the school system where so many teachers are women. So I don't know, we have to sort of break out of this thing about bad man not chat, good, you know, and so on. So there is definitely a kind of psychology of masculinity around Jamaican versus English that we have to try to address. I don't know how we're gonna do it. Maybe we need to have some bad man, some DJs start going to Let school you. and, you know, pick up English, I don't know. So. That Paul, I think, is on to a very good point. Paul, did you want to elaborate? Was there another angle that you felt you, I, I have missed? But I, I think the lack of... No, not necessarily. You, you spoke to precisely the, yes. the perception that I think is um, not encouraging young men to go into the teaching profession. Yes. And... Um, the teaching space is perceived as being inhospitable, <laughs> you know. To women. To men. To men, yes, yes. To men. And many who would venture feel that they will be alienated. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And the salaries in teaching have not traditionally been very good. I think no, many, men, many, that. Men, <laughs> men, <laughs> many men can live off of that. Um, yes. man. Is it men? Exactly. Men feel that. I remember um, a young man. And Pitney. I know I remember a young man who was um, doing part-time um, courses in the Faculty of Humanities and Education, and he explained to me that he couldn't come in full-time because he had to work. Because, you know, him not gonna get no money if he's not no money, you know, him have to have a job so he's viable economically. And I think that is one of the issues with the teaching profession. Thank you for your question, Paul. I'm also seeing a question from Patricia Robinson. And I think this question is coming off the heels of what Professor Cooper spoke about earlier in terms of the freedom from discrimination and the use of language and several proposals that have been made by the Language Planning Agency. Patricia is asking if there is a standardized uh, spelling system for Jamaican words. Yes, it was published in 1967 in the Dictionary of Jamaican English. You know how long ago that is? 67, 77, 87, 97, 2007, 2017, 18, 19, 20, 24, 25. You know, over five decades ago. But the problem is the school system does not take literacy in the Jamaican language seriously. Students are allowed to speak Jamaican in the classroom, but no attempt is made to teach them to be literate in the language. And so the writing system is unimportant. It's not known, it's not taught. And this is one of the things that the, um, the parliament asked for, but parliament didn't know, but some of the people in parliament, they missed all guns and uneducated. I'm sorry, I have no apology. They don't even know that there was a standardized writing system for the Jamaican language. So it exists. 
if you go on YouTube, there's a lovely video by one of the graduates of the Department of Language, Universities and Philosophy called Writing Jamaican the Jamaican Way. And she gives you the whole writing system. I remember once I went to the Pegasus and I was in the parking lot and the guy, one of the gardeners came to me and said, you know, he, he, he tries to read the columns that I write in, in part of, but he can't follow it. I think that was the time at which when I was writing for the Observer and I just wrote it in the Cassidy writing system. I didn't do the proper, proper and the chaka chaka. For the sake of the, the more recently, I've bowed and done that for the readers of the Gleaner. And I said to him, you have a little time? And he said, yes, ma'am. And I wrote down all of the vowels all of the consonants, I explained to them, how, explained to him how you pronounce them, and I write a little sentence, and then pick and spell and read it, and you know what he said? Now go and go teach me picking them. You understand? So people want to learn. People want to know how to use their language to its fullest. They want to be literate in the language, but our school system is not facilitating that process. I heard, I mean, I heard a story which is so alarming. Somebody told me that somebody at the Ministry of Education said, she don't mind if everybody don't pass English and maths at CXE, because if everybody pass English and maths, who would be our helper and our daughter's helper? So it must go from generation to generation, the disadvantage that certain people are advantaged through education and other people are systematically disadvantaged by the school system. Somebody who works at the Ministry of Education is frightening. I don't know if it's true, or some may get it, some may pass it on, you understand? So this is, this is a problem. This really is a fundamental problem that the tools are there, the writing system is there, it's easy to learn, but we are resisting taking the language seriously because back to the issue of power, if everybody can, if everybody is literate in Jamaica, and if everybody is literate in English, then you cannot use language as a weapon to keep people down. So you don't want to teach your children English. You carry on. Whose class are you in? And poor child say, E miss. And that's it. And instead of saying, um, we have children coming into school whose only language is Jamaican. And we are going to use that in the first few years of education to teach them everything, including English. We're not doing it. A writer like Chino Achebe was educated in his mother tongue for most of primary school. It's when he went to high school that he learned English and he became a Nobel Prize winning writer in English. I see, I see. Uh... Yes, Caroline Dice with her hand up. So I'm gonna big allow up, her big to- Big up Caroline, big up Caroline, <laughs> one of my former <laughs> students, now one of my former colleagues. Wow. <laughs> hi, uh, hi uh, Professor Kuhn. Um, big you up, you know. I wanna say something because you know, um, you are my namesake and when, I, and when I tell people that I work at UWE in language, you know, I have to um, account because you are public enemy number one for many people. I know. In, 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 in certain classes. And of course, as you said, it's all about class warfare and, and English being one of the last bastions of, of defense, you know. I, I think, you know, what I want to say is you mentioned that maybe in 200 years, we will have, um, you know, a breakthrough when it comes to language. And you know, that, that may be uh, as long as it's going to take because um, when you think about the good job that the English did in terms of the mental slavery, you know, um, I, when I was doing my, my, my studies, I came across a, um, a document from before slavery and they were talking about after slavery, the post-slavery period came from the UK it was a dispatch, a colonial dispatch sent to the governors in Jamaica and saying that um, after slavery, the aim was to infuse among the colored classes a grammatical knowledge of the English language as the most important agent of civilization. I've never forgotten those words, I thought it then because, 
and um, and it has been very effective. But I think I have reached a point now where I feel that we have to write off a particular generation of periods mm -hmm. of people, okay, who have those closed minds that I have tried to open in many fora. And there are some people, as you say, it's, it's slavery, they are enslaved within this context, which benefits them and move on to the younger generation. And that's what's happening, including your articles that have, you know, made people start to think differently along with the Jamaican New Testament and, and so many other things. Yes. So just to encourage you and yes. say, you. you know, la luta continua. <laughs> And thanks for reminding me of the New Testament. I planned to mention it, but I completely forgot because, you know, when those people give you the bogus test, like translate Macbeth into Patwa, you know, it's, oh, this is impossible. The whole New Testament has been translated into Jamaican. Big deal. And it's being used in churches. And That's people's good. spiritual experience is enriched when they hear the message in Jamaican. And most church, many of the working class churches, God, I wrote a column a few years ago. It said, even Master God, Chad Patwa. Because I said, God, not Chad Patwa. Me sorry for all of them people who are praying to me, not Patwa. You understand? Because. The thing about it, though, is that in the language question is the elephant in the room when it comes to so much to do with education. There's yes. just part out looking at all of the things. And they don't even pay a bad mind to the language situation. It's yes. just. Yeah, these are the experts and, you know, too many of our colleagues and in other educational institutions are still questioning whether it's a language. I mean, I know. Well, Jamaican is more, is, is more different, is, is Portuguese, okay, is more similar to Spanish than Jamaican is the English, but that exactly. language is and nobody questions it. Oh, you know, as I say, our, our language is a dialect with the army and a navy. So if you have political power, you can push your dialect and make it recognized, it to be recognized as a language. And Jamaica has so much cultural power. One of the things that some of these same fufu people don't realize is the degree to which Jamaican language has spread globally and people all over the world are learning the language. If we're not careful, then we'll take it away from us because Japanese, Germans, you know, they're, they're learning the language because the language is associated with the culture, particularly the music. And so they see Jamaica as an exciting culture and our language as something vibrant and dynamic and they want to learn it. And mm -hmm. we're sitting down on it going on like it's foolishness. So when people start to make money teaching Jamaican to foreigners, we say man go and sit down and say, no, look at them come and teach the language and then I make money off of it. Why didn't we do that? That's right. That's right. Well, Professor Cooper, we're definitely going to need a part two, so we're going. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. I'm to have to try to arrange that because my producers are telling me that we can only facilitate. <laughs> right, we're, we can only facilitate two more questions. So no, I'm. Man, seeing... I have to go. And I have to go and want more? Of a makeup for the technology. All right, good. I was concerned time. about you, you know, no, no problem. Man, look how much time we missed because of the screen sharing. If we didn't know more than ever bother with the screen sharing, we would just read out the word then. Even better, even better, because we're a little no, concerned man, about you. No, All man, right, so good. To go on. All right, good. So I'm going to take uh, Mr. Maynard Reed's question, and then I'll take another from the chat. And I saw Anthony Lewis. Uh, I think that's Dr. Lewis. He had a question as well. So let's go in that order and then I'll take big some up, more. Big up, big up, I remember you from our <laughs> Seventh-day Adventist days. I want to say my Seventh-day Adventist past. I presume that you're still a Seventh-day Adventist present. I am. <laughs> but I must say I am so excited that somebody sent me the information so I was able to listen to a portion of your presentation. Thank you, you. And uh, why I sought to speak, uh, seemed like at the last minute uh, you caught up with it, because I was brought up by, uh, not embarrassed about it, by a mother who never allowed me to speak Patwa. Yes. Now that I've grown older, I have among my collections of books, the Jamaican New Testament, and I was about to say, this may be a tool that would be helpful for those who, like me, would like to learn it and understand Absolutely. it. And I find it very fascinating. Thank you very much for sharing again today. The only problem is that the, the New Testament now inscribes a kind of ideology, you know, it, you, uh, you, you know, you get, yeah. you get the religious 
religious indoctrination. But I guess you have to just, it's like the stuff in the market, you just have to, it is married to the ideology, so you have to go through. So, That's right. you know, but um, because, you know, some of those um, New Testament doctrines that, you know, women being subjected to their husbands and all them kind of things, you know, <laughs> for foolishness. Yeah. So, you know, but at least we have a body of texts that people can refer to to say this is what the thing is and it's accessible and it's written down and it's it gives a language presence and visibility. Definitely. Thanks again. And divine blessings. Thank you. And the same to you. Yes. All right, we'll take a question from the chat and then we'll go over to Dr. Lewis. Uh, Kadia Hilton Fraser is asking, how do we counter the vestige of colonialism regarding the acceptance and use of Jamaican in our school system specifically and society more broadly? Well, one of the ways you counter it, I'll never forget, I saw um, a quote a long time ago, the most effective way to fight an alien culture is to live your own. In other words, we are the ones who have to claim the language and just use it. You know, if you can't wait on people to give you permission. Now, the problem with the school system is more complicated because you have these bureaucrats, these the politicians who set policy, and they are the ones who are determining the curriculum and how the thing works. But if, if people were to write the Ministry of Education and say, a whole set of people do a petition. Put it, you know, the ministry, the, the prime minister has this petition thing. If we could get 10,000 people to sign a petition to say, we want bilingual education in Jamaican schools. I think they will be forced to listen to us and maybe it will happen quicker than 200 years from now. I use 200 years in thinking about how long English was repressed in England during the Norman conquest. And it took Chaucer to just say, never write in our English. And you know, that was it. You just need one or two people. Miss Lou, Miss Lou has done so much to bring us to consciousness about the value of our language. But still, as a teacher principal said, Jamaican or part what she calls it is good for literature, is good for Miss Lou's poems, but not for anything else. Now, can you imagine if you were teaching children in a language they understood? how much more they would learn. If you're teaching them maths, you're teaching, look at Dr. Coy's physics translation. It's a structure of the language that's Jamaican. And the vocabulary items can come from anywhere. It can come from English, come from Latin, come from French. Okay, but it is a structure of the language. And when Professor Nettleford is going to call the language unruly and a bastard talk, yes, you know, he was speaking at the time and he was saying that Miss Lou had carved designs out of it. So he was bigging her up for, making something structured out of chaos. But the Jamaican language is not chaos. I remember I passed some students on a tree on campus in my faculty, and they were talking about language, and they were saying something about grammar and thing. And as fast as usual, I went over to them and said, you know, Jamaican has grammar. And I said, miss, we don't want to hear nothing about grammar and Jamaican. Because for them, grammar was about the difficult process of learning English grammar and Jamaican represented freedom. So for me to be coming to impose the concept of grammar on Jamaican was not something that they wanted to hear. So I said, no man, all grammar is a structure of the language that makes you repeat the same kinds of sentences over and over. And how you know when people don't know Jamaican grammar is when you hear foreigners trying to speak it. And it's then you hear bad grammar. And so they laughed and said they understood what I was trying to say. All right, over to you, Dr. Lewis. All right, Professor Cooper, thank you very much for continuing the struggle um, thank you, that we are sir. all in. Um, just to mention before I go on to the point that I want to uh, talk about, remember that Dr. Farkison from the Jamaican Language Unit had done this uh, petition and we didn't get enough of the the numbers that we wanted, the 15,000 people to um, help to make yeah. that a viable proposition. So there's okay. also the conscientization that, that is necessary to get Absolutely, people. I had forgotten about that petition. Yes. You know. But you have to publicize it. You know, you can't yeah. just 
put it up and expect that people are going to sign. Right. So that's one point. But my my my, my major point is about the the global uh, reach of the language that you mentioned and that yes. um, Carolyn um, Deitch, uh, my former lecturer, <laughs> also engaged. The fact is that the language outside of Jamaica is moving faster than we are moving locally. Yes. Um, speaking from the, the perspective of the translators and interpreters associated with Jamaica, we have been getting in recent times a lot of requests for work into and out of Jamaican Creole. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this is coming from all kinds of countries all over the world. So it, it's one of the challenges that we're going to see coming up in another several years that the language that we own that comes from us is going to become something that other people are benefiting from because we have failed to take ownership of it in a, in a, in a very real way. So when you have uh, people teaching Jamaican Creole in Canada and the United Kingdom, I went to Venezuela some years ago and they're studying Louis Bennett's, Bennett's poems in the middle of the Andes at university. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have all of these people outside of Jamaica becoming the cadre who are studying and using the language and we are rejecting it at home, you have your dancehall artists who are singing the thing and then that becomes currency for somebody in Japan to be working on the language and translating things for Japanese people. We're not involved anywhere there. So that's one of the, the, the things that we have to begin. Those of us who are in this debate need to begin to be able to talk to people and to show them their own self-interest in preserving, developing, and using the language in a different kind of context from the one that Louis Bennett used it how many decades ago. Um, I don't know how we're going to do that because it's been extremely difficult because we're at ground level with the discussion. All kind of foolishness. We don't really be knowing no discussion about language is what is actually happening. And we are always there. We have moved much beyond there. I don't know. know. It's, it's sad. Um, although my nephew Cole sent this to me as a direct message, I'm going to share it. Excellent lecture, Auntie. I learned a lot. I'm so proud of my nephew. <laughs> Bright little young man. All right, I'll take one last one from the okay. chat and okay. we'll call it a day. So I'm going to save the chat. It would be nice to save the chat that perhaps we can answer some of the questions. Yes, we could do that. And I we'll sorry, email I, it. Yeah, I just want to note that Carolyn Dyer just posted to everyone an important point. How many Jamaicans realize that Jamaican is one of the languages in the drop down menu that we can choose from as our mother tongue when we are applying for US and Canadian visas? So others are recognizing it as a language while we are still hesitant about it. Hesitant is a very polite word, Carolyn. We don't All right, and Man, Man and Banton is going to take us home with his last question. With this last question, um, he's saying, what can be done for us to learn to read the Jamaican language? He says he's willing to learn. What you have to do is to practice. You, you get the Jamaican Bible. That is one place to practice, but maybe you missed it when I said that there's a lovely YouTube video about um, how to write Jamaican, the Jamaican way, the Jamaican language unit teaches, is about to introduce a course in how to be literate in Jamaican. If I remember correctly, I think this is what Dr. Farkerson told me recently, when well, I told me recently, I think he said it in a lovely lecture he gave to Kiwanis um, week before last. So, um, you know, contact the Jamaican language unit at the University of the West Indies and they will tell you how you can learn. I write a column in the Gleaner once a month in Jamaican and I use what I call the Chaka Chaka and Proper Proper. And if you compare the two, two versions, you will begin to see how you can use the writing system, the official one properly. So, you have to, you just have to make up your mind to do it, you know, just do it. All right, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Carolyn Cooper. And I'm sure you can see the sentiments in the chat. Many persons are impressed and they are happy 
that you gave such a riveting presentation. Uh, you can just scroll through and see all the sentiments that are being expressed there. And we're so appreciative of the lecture. It really opened our eyes. Many times we think of the idea of discrimination and we think naturally about you know, social status and class, that sort of a thing. And many of us don't recognize how much it is that language can be tied even to social status and social class and even discrimination. And Professor Cooper has shed some light on that and we do appreciate that presentation. And I'm gonna be asking at this time, uh, Mrs. Beverly Josephs, as well as our, I like to call her our executive producer for this program, uh, Ms. Ms. Patrice spencer Grizzle to stand by as they'll be making presentations to Mrs. Hillary Pamela Kelly, as well as Professor Carolyn Cooper. So we're gonna start with uh, Mrs. Josephs. You can go ahead with your presentation and then I will segue to Mrs. spencer Grizzle. Thank you. Mrs. Kelly, it is a joy for us to present this beautiful plant to you as a symbol of how the seed that's of excellence that you have planted has blossomed and grown into a beautiful, rich legacy, which continues to pay dividends each year in these lectures. This one being no different. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Josephs, and thanks to everybody. I hope that the, the plant will flourish as much as the center has. <laughs> um, my, my mother used to be very disappointed in my <laughs> gardening, gardening skills. <laughs> but I will try my best with it. Thank you so much. I love orchids, and I hope it will last for a long time, and I remember you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Your turn. Okay. Professor Cooper, I'm not sure where I should start. Should I? I started when I persuaded my boss to write you that letter, or should I start it when you called to turn me down and I went to my knees? Oh, you didn't see that. It was off camera. <laughs> Beg you to reconsider. Formidable. You're a formidable woman. Right Thank you so much for reconsidering. This has been such an interesting talk. And some of what you refer to are things that I was very familiar with because I have two sons who, when I speak Patwa to them, go to me and say, Mom, we can't understand you. And a Jamaica, them bad, angry. So <laughs> what you speak about is very true, very on point and very interesting. And I'm going to talk to my boss again and see if I can get a part two follow up. Right, boss? <laughs> but it was very interesting. And I back. thank you so much for being here with us. And um, as you can see, you mentioned that you, um, well, no, I did some research and found out that you like orchids. So I went and got orchids again. Then you went in this um, to chat, talk and said that you like white. So guess which one you got? Thank well, you. Thank you very much for Beautiful. being here with us. Beautiful. And um, thank you. looking forward to having more time with you. Yes, thank and you. it doesn't have to wait to be a big shot lecture like this, you know. We can just organize up some con you know, conversation where people come and talk about the issues. All right, thank you very much. And Dr. Wart Latibodier is going to be giving the vote of thanks at this time. They say that all good things <laughs> must come to an end. Professor Carolyn Cooper, Professor Emerita 
meritorious of a big thank you. We certainly appreciated what you gave us. That in the language of Miss Lou was a bununus performance. And we look forward to continuing this discussion. Whose class are you in? I thought you would have put on the program a FUFA class here, you know. <laughs> well, we certainly appreciated that and the discussion and for all of those individuals who came in support of your especially invited guests, we certainly thank you and all of them. Professor Barrett for bringing greetings from the faculty. Certainly, we'll continue this to be Professor Barrett because, you know, Professor Barrett took me on upstairs, um, Professor Cooper, because Professor Barrett is not really of this philosophy, <laughs> but I'll be engaging her some more on this point. Um, Mrs. Kelly, you continue to mellow with the years for giving us this and making it possible. We certainly thank you. We don't want to overlook Dr. Harold McDermott, whose name is to be one of those thanked each year because yes. of the fact that he has proposed this and initiated a venture like this. Uh, Mr. Rolando Smith, Yes, things flowed very well. And what would we do without the gelling agent that the MC provides? Certainly appreciate that. We want you to come over fully to the LTRC. Mrs. Bev Josephs, or full-time part-timer, when asked to make up the presentation, Mrs. Joseph says anything for Mrs. Kelly. Yes, reminding us of the twinkle in that lady's eyes, this humble being. Mrs. Kelly, a very nice soul. Mrs. Tressica Campbell Dawes, for your positive um, introduction of our distinguished guest lecturer, and a second time accepting um, this task on our program for the Pam Kelly Lecture. We certainly thank you for that. Mrs. Pencil Grizzle, planning the planner backbone behind everything. Thanks for the days and the weeks and the months of sacrifice. A big mountain I know is off your back and mine too. I hear talking about a follow up to this and certainly I'll be in for, for that. Um, Mrs. Jared for providing the link. How can we overlook persons who provide the link for this um, um, function virtually? Uh, Mr. Siobhan um, Hibbert and also Mr. Joel Smith compliments or thanks to Ms. Marilyn Stacey from the BACAT team for providing the technical support for us and giving us assistance. Ms. Miller for setting up and providing decoration for all persons who are who have come out, made the sacrifice and supported. We saw upwards of 160 individuals. That is really a massive turnout for um, an event virtually like this. And even when we had the little pause, persons sat right there in that little classroom, patiently awaiting um, the teacher of the moment, um, Professor um, Hooper. Again, thank you and thank you everyone for what it is that you have done to make this event a success. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Latibadir. So, ladies and gentlemen, of course, your presence here today indicates that, of course, we, ha you ha we have your support in continuing to develop the language, teaching, and resource center, which must now address new challenges, as you heard, as it relates not only to the teaching of language, but also academic literacy, not only in Jamaica, but even across the Caribbean. All of this, you know, while working to achieve the university's mission, vision, as well as objectives. Ladies and gentlemen, this has indeed been an awesome evening, a great evening, and it was my pleasure moderating. Thank you all so much for the participant participation, rather, as well as the continued support. Thank you very much. Good evening and walk good.